Brilliant. Lord, I just pray a blessing on Colin this morning that you would speak through him to us this morning. In Jesus' name. Amen. Over to you. Amen. Thanks, Joy. Uh, if you have Bibles, I'm going to be reading a few verses from the beginning of the second chapter of Ephesians. I know we've been in Ephesians quite a lot the last few months, but I was drawn to this particular passage um, and it will become a, you'll become aware why when I read it to you. Um, so it's Ephesians chapter 2, the first seven verses, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Today is the second Sunday of the Easter season. We're actually still in the season of Easter up until Pentecost. And this Sunday is celebrated by our Roman Catholic friends and some of our Anglican friends as Divine Mercy Sunday. I see Teresa there smiling because she'll be very familiar as a Pole and as a Roman Catholic uh, with this story I'm about to tell. She could probably do it better than I can. But uh, this is something I just wanted to share with us. This feast today, um, it's not a very uh, old feast. It's a feast that was actually instituted by Pope John Paul II on that Sunday, that, uh, that second Sunday of Easter, on Sunday the 30th of April 2000. And on that same day, he declared his fellow Pole, Sister Faustina Kowalska, or give her a proper name, Sister Maria Faustina Kowalska, who was a saint, he declared her a saint of the church. And it was also on the eve of that feast, strangely, that five years later, on April the 2nd, 2005, John Paul II went to be with the Lord and he died. Now, the story of Sister Faustina is linked to this painting hanging behind me. This is my PowerPoint this morning. I don't have to mess about with buttons. This is my PowerPoint. Some of you will be familiar with this because this is the copy of the image of Divine Mercy, which hung for a number of years from 2009 to 2019 in the King's Hall. And it was painted by a lady called Agnieszka Szewczyk, who is one of the small Polish community that met there for a number of years. And they gifted this picture to us as a thank you for our hosting them through that time. Now, I became interested in the story of Sister Faustina in 2008, when I went with a small team from CCE, including my daughter, Abby, to Slovakia and Poland. And we stayed for part of the time on a retreat with the folks from River Fellowship in the retreat house in, uh, the, of the Divine Mercy in Sychla Zakopane, right down the south of Poland in the beautiful Tatra Mountains. Now we had some of our gatherings in the chapel there uh, in the retreat house in Sychla. And I was really struck by the painting over the altar. One like this painting. In most Catholic chapels I've been in, the centerpiece is a crucifix, and you'll know that. It focuses on the cross. In fact, most Anglican churches, many, many churches you go into, there's a cross in the centerpiece, focusing on the cross, the death of Jesus. But here was Jesus alive in glory with light streaming from his heart and a hand raised in blessing. I found something really powerful about this image, and so I wanted to know more. And as I researched, I uncovered a whole story 
of revelation and visions of Jesus, which touched me deeply and still does. The story starts in February 1931, almost exactly 90 years ago, when Jesus appeared to 26-year-old sister Faustina in a dream uh, when she was in a convent in Płock in Poland. And he instructed her to have a painting of him done as he was appearing to her in the dream with the words beneath it, Jesus, I trust in you. And she also began to keep a diary of her visions. Uh, sorry, I got lost in my notes there, but she didn't find anyone in Płock who could help her get the painting done. Then in May 1933, Sister Faustina was transferred to a convent in Vilnius, which is now, of course, the capital of Lithuania, but at that time it was still part of Poland. And there she began to share about her vision with her priest, a man called Father Michael Sopochko. He was so worried about her that he sent her to a psychiatrist. Now imagine there's a few people that pe people today might think of doing that. We say we're to hearing from God. Jesus is talking to us. We're having visions. And so this, this priest who was a confessor was so concerned, he sent her to a psychiatrist. But when she came back, the psychiatrist said she was in full and perfect mental health. And so Father Sapotico realized that he needed to listen to this, what she was sharing. And he decided that he was going to help Sister Faustina. And they actually found an artist who could paint the image, a man named Eugeniusz Kazimierowski. But it was a difficult task. One of the th great difficulties this man had in painting was that he was working under instruction from Sister Faustina who couldn't paint and who sometimes would get frust so frustrated she was in tears because he couldn't fully reproduce the glory of what she had seen in her vision. And uh, it, it had to be repainted and retouched and no, it's not like that, it should be like this, no more of that. And in the end, she couldn't reproduce the glory of what, he, what she'd seen. One of the other things that Jesus had spoken to Sister Faustina was that his divine mercy should be celebrated a week after Easter on what was traditionally called Low Sunday. And on the 28th of April, 1935, for the first time, the painting was used during a Eucharist in the Church of the Gate of Dawn in Vilnius. Also, Sister Faustina shared that Jesus had given her a prayer of devotion, which could be prayed on her rosary, called the Chaplet of the Divine Mercy. It's simply an offering to the Father of Jesus' suffering and a cry for mercy on the whole world. A sister Faustina had an amazing vision that one day many people would come to faith in Jesus through the image and strange, imagine this, she had a vision that the Pope would be there in the midst of them. Now that really sounds far-fetched and outlandish. By the end of the 1930s, sister Faustina sadly fell ill with tuberculosis and she died in the convent in Krakow to which she had by then moved on the 5th of October, 1938. Less than a year later, Poland was invaded by the Nazi forces. During that terrible time of occupation, one young student worked just across the road, a short distance away from the convent where Sister Faustina had died. His name was Karol Wojtyła, and he was an able-bodied man, and therefore he was made to work in the Solvay chemical factory there. He was actually training secretly to become a priest. And later in his life, he was destined to become first Archbishop of Krakow, and then of course, Pope John Paul II. He had a particular love for the message of divine mercy, which Sister Faustina had communicated. And his second general papal letter, sometimes called an encyclical, uh, in 1993 was called rich in mercy, dives in misericordia in the Latin. And this had at its heart the message of the father's love shown in the story of the prodigal son in Luke and the good news that Jesus is mercy incarnate and his arms are open to us because God's love is greater, as he said, than our betrayal of him. What a powerful thing to say that is, that God's love is greater than our capacity to betray him. 
just to bring this particular part of the story to a close, in the year 2000, on the second Sunday of Easter, Pope John Paul II himself in St. Peter's in Rome proclaimed Sister Faustina a saint of the church and proclaimed this feast as well, which is now celebrated by many Christians throughout the world. And then within a couple of years, by 2002, a new church, a basilica, had been built at Wagievniki in Krakow, next to the chapel where Sister Faustina's remains were placed in the convent where she died, and where a Polish copy, rather like this one, still hangs today, and is visited there by thousands. The original painting still hangs in Vilnius. Now, I'm going to show you a small, I have a small picture of the original painting. That's the original. And you can see it's quite different in a way from the copy that was made later. And there's great uh, discussion goes on about which is the authentic one. But this is the original. And it's a fair bit darker. But what I love about the original is the light in the heart of Jesus as the blood and the water come out, as the light that shines from him. It's a painting that talks about Jesus's light in the darkness. And underneath it has the Polish sign, Jezu Ufam Tobie. And uh, it's just a, a beautiful representation. And actually, the chapel in Vilnius in Lithuania, where this picture hangs, is open 24-7 as a prayer place. Day and night, people are praying there and calling on God for his mercy to be uh, sh shown throughout the world. Now, the reason I wanted to share this with you today is simply to consider that God's mercy and his message of love is wider than our own tradition and theology. His heart is for the world, but he communicates with so many traditions and cultures in different ways. And this has become a passion of my own heart to see those once divided coming together. You know, a lot of people might look at this, a lot of people look at this picture and say, oh, it's a very Catholic image. It's a very Roman Catholic tradition. But you know what's funny? I've been listening this week to my friends in Slovakia in a Roman Catholic church who are singing American songs translated into Slovak, you know, songs by Will Regan. They're using songs from another tradition that are not their own. And therefore it behoves us, I think, as well to say, what is it, God, you're saying through others' tradition? And we need to be open and ready to receive what Jesus is saying because he's not interested in our labels and our confessions, our traditions and our theologies. He's looking for the move of his spirit in every heart. And the God is moving throughout the earth by his spirit in many different traditions. The scripture I started from, uh, started with from Ephesians 2, 1 to 7 is a demonstration of that heart to embrace all the world in mercy. It's interesting, it's very, it's, it's, it's not easy to note, particularly from our English translation, but Paul in this chapter started, starts off talking about you, but you were dead. And then he carries on, but, and we too were dead. And this change, this little subtle change where he starts off in that chapter talking about you, let me just refer back to it. You were dead because of your disobedience. You used to be like the rest of the world. But then he also goes on to say that all of us used to live that way. And there are scholars who suggest that he's talking in you, he's talking to the non-Jews. Paul, of course, is a Jew. And he's talking to the non-Jews first and saying, you were dead, you were under the power of Satan. But actually, we Jews, we were no better because we were guilty of lust and passion and we were fighting against the God who loved us. And so he puts in this you and we. If you look again in that chapter, you'll find there's a you and a we. Uh, two people groups divided from one another by a wall of hostility and partition. But, says God, sorry, but Paul says God who is rich in mercy. I love the Greek there, plusios and eli. It says in the Greek. Now, if you the, the word Eli, if you know the Greek word Kyrie eleison, Lord have mercy, that's often used in uh, traditional um, services. Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison. That word Eli, Eli is the word for mercy. So plusios and Eli, rich in mercy, and he's saying that God is rich in mercy. He's so rich in mercy that by means of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our sin has given us life together with Christ. Now, 
to, we always think of that and say, it's together with Christ. I am together with Christ. And that is so, but actually Paul is talking about the togetherness which brings Jews and Gentiles into the same salvation. Those of all nations, those of all traditions who named Jesus, who are brought together and he raised us up together and he made us sit down together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why? Because when Jesus sits down, he is there for all of us who believe. He's there for all of us who reach out to his mercy. He is there and he's brought us together in him. What Paul is saying is that you Gentiles were dead in your sin. We Jews were no better, subject to lust and passion and God's anger. But God, who is rich in mercy, plusios and eli, rich in mercy, he took hold of both of us and he swept us together in heaven, in, into heaven in Jesus, who is the king of the Jews and the savior of the nations. And that's what I see when I look at this picture. It's important actually to me, it's maybe difficult to see from the distance you're at, but it's important to me that this picture was painted of Jesus with the wounds in his hands and his feet and the, the suggestion of the wounds in his side and his heart coming out of him. Um, because from that heart, sorry, I'm just using notes here this morning, from that heart streams the blood and the water, which is our salvation and the river of eternal life. In his general letter, Rich in Mercy, Pope John Paul II explored the background to this mercy. And in a footnote to the section on the Old Testament in his, uh, in his letter, in footnote 52, he points to the fact that the word chesed is a rich word denoting not just God's agreement with Israel, but his irrevocable commitment to us because of his deep love, which is beyond our betrayal. You can imagine, you know me, if, you, if any of you know me, that word has said, when I found that in Pope John Paul II's encyclical, even in a footnote, I was jumping up and down saying, yes, yes, that's what it is. It's God's commitment and covenant. And there it was here. And that just increased my excitement about what is trying to be uh, conveyed through this picture, that Jesus is there and he's committed to us. His love is greater than our betrayal. And Sister Faustina spoke in her diary about divine mercy of the depth of this love, and she called it an abyss of mercy, an ocean without a floor. Anyone who knows me will know how much that sparks in me, that excitement, because hesed is that word which means an irrevocable, self-sacrificial commitment because of covenant which in Hebrew today, in modern Hebrew, actually is the word, hesed is the word that is used for grace. In fact, if you, if you get hold of a Google Translate app on your phone and you say the word, if you put the Hebrew translator on and you say the word hesed into the translator, it will give you the English word grace. And this is the amazing fact that God's mercy is also his grace. There's such a rich mind. In fact, I've shared something about this story of divine mercy and this particular story in my book. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It's a big, quick plug. God of Covenant, God of Grace. It's out on Amazon and uh, you can have a look. I can't go into all the ins and outs of it, but that's it there. If you want to have a look at more about this, uh, I've got a, a bit at the end of it about this story and how it links to the whole, the whole mercy of God. God's mercy, God's hesed grace, is bottomless. It is fathomless. You can't exhaust it. And it's guaranteed to us, not by our being good enough, not by our being of a particular nation or tradition, but because God is rich in this attribute. I just want in closing to remind us one thing. When Paul writes these words, God who is rich in mercy, as a Jew and a Pharisee soaked in the scriptures, he will have in sight the revelation of God himself to Moses in Exodus 34, when God speaks the depths of his nature to his servant. And he says, he reveals and he says, the Lord, the Lord, 
the favoring, compassionate God, slow to anger and rich in hesed grace, rich in mercy. It's interesting that Paul is writing to the Ephesians and he's writing to people who would have read the scriptures in Greek, in the Greek version. They wouldn't have known Hebrew and they would have had their Old Testament in the Greek at that point. And so actually those words, rich in mercy or great, uh, great in mercy, I love the, the, the Greek word that's used there. Of, it's polyelios. Elios is the word for mercy. And God is polyelios. He's multi-mercied, multi-mercied. You have a multi-mercied God, a God who is polyelios, who is so great in mercy. And this is not the mercy of a Caesar's whim. It's not a raising a thumb to spare a gladiator instead of giving a, a thumbs down to bring his death with no reason beyond it, beyond the pleasure of a man. But this is unwavering covenanted intention of God who made us and loves us. Jesus loves you. And in this picture, I see him holding out his wounded hands to us and pointing to the love of his heart and the power of his blood and his life that he gives today. If you're now watching this with us or if you watch it later on live stream and you don't know him, if you don't know that mercy, that love and that grace which streams to you, he's saying today, just like on the bottom of that picture, trust in me, Jesus. If, can you say, Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I will trust in you. Will you put your hand in his outstretched hand? Will you follow him? He's saying today, trust me, follow me, and I will save you from that death without limit. And I will instead give you life without limit. Jesus, I trust in you. Can we pray for a moment together? Father, your mercy is fathomless. Your love is just, we cannot get to the bottom of it. It's immeasurable. Lord, your, your grace is incomparable to us today. Oh Lord, as many in your, your people around the world are celebrating this vision that was given at a time, difficult time in world history, when things were about to just become so difficult, you gave this picture as a sign that God, you are still reaching out to us, that so you still love us. So Lord, we reach out back to you. We put our hand in your hand. We say, Jesus, we're coming to you. We want to trust in your mercy. We want to trust in you. Whatever our circumstances, whatever our circumstances are telling us, whatever our past has told us, whatever our education has told us, Lord, we respond to you, Lord Jesus, today, as we see you in your risen glory, as we see you in the glory with which you stood before Thomas when he doubted your reality and you stood before him and you showed him your hands and your feet and your side. And he said, my Lord and my God, we stand before you and say, my Lord and my God. And if this morning you haven't met Jesus, if you haven't given him your life, trust him today, put your life in his hands. Just say to him, Jesus, I'm sorry that I've been living without you. I'm sorry that I've been living without the light of you in my life. I thank you for your death for me on the cross. I thank you that you've risen again for me and that you've made me seated with you in heavenly places. Lord, let the reality of that fill my life. Holy Spirit, I invite you to come. Forgive me my sin and give me new life with you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks very much for the opportunity to share this morning. If you've got more questions, um, I'd be glad to answer them and, uh, and just have a good day, this divine mercy day, and let his mercy continually flow through you. And I think we're going to actually go to David, who's got another section, David and Seraphine. It's so lovely to see them together. Uh, so lovely to see people singing together. <laughs> Um, and we're just going to hand back for them to do their next part of worship as we close this part of the meeting.